Well, hello, lovely listeners. Um, I've got the honor of speaking with Laura Belcher today. Laura empowers women to meet their potential and guides them to create their path towards happiness and wealth through their intrinsic passions. Laura is a business mentor and photographer. I'm a, a bit of a budding photographer myself, and I had a quick look at some of your photos on your website. Wow, um, really loved them. And um, Laura on her bio, put, she was designed to build other people's dreams, whether that's through capturing the most powerful image for a brand, a model, or mentoring people in their business. And it wasn't until Laura stood in her own power and believed she was enough when it came to her own wisdom and experience that true alignment happened in Laura's life. So I'm intrigued to hear how that came about. And um, I'm so pleased to have you here. And as I said, I did have a quick look at your website. And um, yeah, I loved your photos and um, so colorful. And I've always wanted to try and achieve that. So um, yeah, over to you, Laura, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much, Firsty Mel, for such a lovely, interesting, colourful introduction to me. I'm very, very grateful, and I'm really, really grateful for your space. And yeah, I really hope what I can bring can give value to your listeners. Um, but yeah, I guess everything you just said is sort of just me laying everything bare, really, in terms of definitely who I've been and who I am now. Um, yeah, I don't know what you want me to share or what oh. I can like expand on for you, Firsty. Yeah, I mean. The I I just love to hear my guests sort of backstory, um, maybe a bit about you know you growing up, how you got into photography. I suppose that's the one of the big things. What sort of drove you as a younger woman, um, and how did you get to that point? Obviously, where you are now, where you had this, I am enough, yeah. and I can and I can because you you've also got this big vision um, of empowering ten million. Women? Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to do more, Mel. I've oh. got something inside of me. I think I'll do more. <laughs> but yeah. So, it, it, and I guess it's so funny, isn't it? I could feel my ego talking, and I'm like, no, <laughs> it's from my heart. It is from my heart. But um, it is from a place of like utter, utter passion. And uh, well, thank you so much again for like wanting to hear and giving me space. But yeah, to sort of take it back and not sort of give you 32 years of <laughs> life, which is how old I am now. Um, for me, it started from such a place as a young girl where I always thought, uh, I always looked at others and I always had something inside of me that thought, if that man can be rich and powerful and happy and have all these things, so can I. I, I always used to think we're all born the same. We're all born the same. We're all born the same. Later in my life and in the last couple of years, especially, I started to understand the concept of privilege and actually how privilege can be super invisible sometimes, which is why it's quite a weird topic and a strange thing to identify until you start speaking and listening, listening to other stories and so on. So um, I do understand now that the, how that can fold into the opportunities and the platforms we are placed on or we sit. But that's all I thought for as a very young girl. I always thought it and I was gaslighted quite a lot, I think, by adults because they used to sort of want to, you know, place their fears or limitations on me and be like, oh, you know, well, they've got this and they've got that and those things. And, you know, I was brought up in a very beautiful, provided for um, environment, but quite a lack around money mindset. I was very aware that we couldn't afford everything. I was very aware that you know, they could afford that and we couldn't. I always felt very much like we were working class and, you know, um, and that that was it really. And it's just weird because I also, at that very young age, couldn't cope with being put in a box. And what I mean by that is it's almost like, um, I think we we sort of, well, we're born into it, aren't we? Because we're born into a ladder of supremacy and hierarchy. So, you know, there, there is history, the placement of just men and women, for instance, and stuff like that. So we're all sort of, placed in those situations and and you know and for whatever you identify and whatever your lived experience is you will have moments where you see where you just live and then you you find out well you know that's the way I'm going to be spoken to in that environment or when I wear that or that's what that's what will happen when I do that and then you start almost just accepting the world around us and it's you know it's this whole concept that's obviously been brought forward recently around how we deal with the safety of women walking alone and stuff like that you know and again that's for another whole topic but it is it, it's it's a very weird paradox isn't it when we remove ourselves out of it and it's like isn't it weird that we're still validating this problem 
as opposed to get it and validating the symptoms as I get like ruin it out and getting to the cause. And so um, uh, this is sort of all the stuff I was faced with. And then I think you go into education, Mel, and that's where, again, you're putting boxes because they're like, what subjects do you want to be good at or what do you mm -hmm. want to learn? Or, yeah. you know, and, and I always used to question that. Always, always. I was that annoying child. Every school report, honestly, it's so funny, Mel. It was like, Laura likes to debate. She likes to question everything. She likes to, you know, um, because I, you know, I always did. And um, and so, yeah, and then I always as well had this feeling of, I felt almost caged. I almost used to fight for freedom against like that nine to five um, stereotypical old type of older generational expectation of a woman's life. How you were, how the success story was to graduate, to get a good job, to find a good provider to get married to have a house to have three children and to live like that that male was like I knew from a young age it was like I was fighting against it it was something instinctively I was like oh, well that's not for me and um and I couldn't figure it out and and I, I've I've got there now in the last year and I understand it so much more clearer now I can empower it as opposed to developing bad traits from it I guess but um but yeah anyway so it started in that place and the only where the only place I felt super free and 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 I loved fully was performing so I skipped to 22 and um, I had graduated um, with a musical theatre degree in from London in a conservatoire I was really grateful I was very privileged in the environment that I worked in and the opportunities I was given and then um at 22 Mel sort of when it started for me I went and lived in Canada for a year so I lived in Canada for a year and as well, sorry, to because I'll link in photography. I, yeah. I know you asked for it. Um, so at 22, I go over to Canada and um, I spend a year there. And the sole purpose was to make it as a movie star and to be famous and to be seen and and so on. And um, I was really, really like I had a great lot of opportunities. And again, I threw a lot of privilege, really, of, of what is just placed on you as a white woman and you know that it had that's grown in an environment like London and studied in London that holds privilege in the world um so yeah I, I mean I was definitely really lucky like I worked on Warner Brothers a couple of sets and done a, a few like sort of like here and there parts um nothing too like interested Mel but I, I was very grateful and I also played like a lead in a short film I was in a music video I went down to Vegas and actually worked as a showgirl for a bit down there wow so all a bit crazy really and all a bit mental um and entwined with all of that I'm, I used to model because it sort of went hand in hand you know um it, it did and again the privilege game of understanding like what like understanding now but like slim privilege pretty pretty privilege all of this western cultured life of what's correct and and desired the most I got more opportunities but when I was in that now I always used to and, and just skipping into that modeling bit sometimes I would model for like um photography workshops and what's so funny um as you comment on my work is that and this is where it sort of come from really is I used to just feel very passionate about creating frames I used to feel very passionate about bringing stillness to like a lot alive I was very passionate about yeah bringing that emotion through in an image as opposed to um, a performative still I wanted I always felt like that as a model I wanted to give that to the photographer so I almost used to in reflection mentor the photographer Mel when I used to say well if you get down low I'll get up and then I'm gonna jump and if you shoot I mean I didn't obviously understand like shutter speed and ISO and all of that stuff then but I was also very, very inquisitive when I was young. I loved learning. And again, it went hand in hand with like challenging that status quo. I always ask questions. So if that's that and that's that, why is that? And what's that? And so at the time, I really enjoyed that aspect. It wasn't sort of there that I was just sort of taking on that role as a model. I really enjoyed like learning and what they were doing and learning a little around lighting. And as well, it's helping me because I could be a better model for them if I understood lighting and things like that. So that's sort of, I guess, where the passion and interest come and grew as I got older and older and like because I did feel it then I just I wasn't ready to be behind the camera Mel I was in front of it <laughs> you know what I, mean? I was that child so um so yeah I got to um I got to that point in my life after doing that year and um I started to can, question can I ask can I ask why Canada have? why Canada and not LA or whatever well, um, it sort of links in, firstly, because I could get a visa to go to Canada. It's quite right. a simple one. Very, again, very privileged in the UK as a Commonwealth country. 
um, they had like a year's working visa that was optional for us. I also understood that a lot come up from the LA, from the West Coast, from LA to Vancouver, because it sits directly above it. And it was cheaper to film up there for a lot of the production houses. So they would bring it up a lot. Um, but again, hand in hand with what happened there, I um, I really was, man, I would understand it now. Like I was safe, but I don't want to gasp like my own experience, but I was sexualized a lot. I was objectified a lot. And I hated it. I hated the misogyny because guess what? That little girl inside of me thought she could do anything and she and she thought she could be as powerful as a man or she thought she could be as rich as that. And it's so weird I used to think that because, uh, again, you see how, like, uh, ingrained we were that young because I used to just think that, but I, I never realised. Why wasn't I saying at that young? Why I don't I want to be as rich as a woman? And I think we have evolved so much in the last 20 years, but I think when I was 10, 22 years ago, I probably did just see a lot more of that. You know, even at that point, the internet wasn't here. We just we just got fed the information we were surrounded by, I guess, in our families and at school. So um, it was more about talking about wealth on a level of, it was a lot more men then, I guess. Um, it must have been, but but yeah, so you can imagine I didn't really enjoy that part. I was like, mm -hmm. what's happening here? And, and it was weird, because the further I got up the ladder, the worse it got. And I'm sure it was all around the ladder, to be honest, but it really was overwhelming to be, you know, and I was a young woman at 22, like in those rooms where you were solely like pointed out, sexualized, objectified. And then what was the crazy thing is everyone in the room was almost jealous they weren't. So right. you're in this place of going, why am I here? Is it because of everything I look like or is it my brain and what I do? And so anyway, I come home. I was like sort of reset, joined a gym, just working as um, a receptionist at the time. So I was a bit lost. Then I sort of thought, well, I don't want to be a part of this. And I thought, well, surely extrinsically, as I get higher up the ladder and get better jobs, I like it more. I'll be happier. I'll feel more seen. I'll feel more powerful. But guess what? That didn't happen. So anyway, um, there I am back at the gym trying to figure it out. Got a job like just freelancing as well and um, making some money on the side. And I met this girl and we sort of sat down one day and just really hit it off. Her uh, family were very, very influenced as business owners. And we were 22. I think I was 23 at the time, 24. We basically sat there and we just made, we just thought, let's start a business. And um, she was heavily influenced by property in her family. So that sort of, I guess, came through a little. And then we just sat down and was like, you know what? There's not a lot of professional shared housing in Kent, which is where I live. It was very common in London, but it wasn't so much in Kent. And so, yeah, a long story short, from 2015 to 2020, I built that company. And I built it with her. We built it with nothing. Um, and you can imagine, Mel, faced every every avenue of being like with ageism with sexism like in property you know like in in hindsight as well when I look back everybody we employed was all male other than our cleaners cleaners and um somebody who worked as an assistant for us but again it, it's sort of we well, you know you don't want to validate the system but it sort of was happening like that because it was just what was presented to us and even just the way that we got used to the way we were spoke to um, and what we had to tackle and sort of divert around and sort of um you know in toxic masculine environments we 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 were so clever and assertive and I think this is the thing about the feminine energy at the forefront we were so clever that we almost used to know we had to stroke their egos to be able to prove what we knew that we could do as a business yeah. Yeah. um so we navigated all of that and built it all very very proud you know over time we got to like a hundred tenants we definitely turned around a hundred tenants in time um we were still directing well I wasn't directing another company Laura was um she was working on a different company too and I was because we were both still trying to earn money again very um naive in business and just full of passion and fire. We were the last ones to pay ourselves, you know, like, and, and it was like that. And even when we were bringing in six figure revenue, um, which in total over the time of the five years, it, it would have been up to seven, like as in, in, in the total look at the whole thing. But um, I just was unhappy, Mel. And it was funny because it got to the end of 2019 and my business partner was pregnant. And I remember her sort of having a big conversation with me saying, I don't know, if I want to do this after having a baby, I don't know. Um, 
and we really like it was really hard and can you imagine my ego that little girl who wanted to be that powerful man and everything else it was just like hurting it was so torn it was so punched the face I was like who the hell am I going to be without this business owner title but what I also understood and some of my really close friends at the time very careful on my ego were like Laura like you don't really want to turn up sometimes and honestly Mel I thought oh my god this is so true you know why am I doing all of this for all of the pressure and all the responsibility of a fan or a director? And we had tons of responsibilities in a legal sense as well around tenancy law, around everything, you know, people's health and mind and every wellness and, you know, and then the other side of stuff with contracts, legals and landlords and so on. Um, and in between this space in like 2018, I bought a professional camera for the first time. And uh, I just sort of started going out with it. Um, I used to be in London a lot in the sales job. And um, I used to just just experiment and have everything on manual. And I just learned how to shoot with different types of lighting, I think, there. And then because I loved um, photography and I was really getting into it, I was trying to find what I wanted to shoot. And I love shooting women. I loved empowering them. And, and that's where I was like, and, and that, but again, where we're not taught that at school, we're taught we're meant to go out to work to earn money. I was just enjoying this. It was such, it was such flow for me, what I call and teach flow now. It was just so intrinsic. It wasn't like, you know, there was nothing there. Um, and so um, I was, at the time, it's crazy when I look back, I was managing the business, pulling in money in the sales job too, and then shooting wherever I could. Um, and I was very, very um, grateful that an opportunity I met um, two ladies that have founded a business um, that were working with influencers at the time. And, and so for free, they offered me to go on a trip and be able to shoot on behalf of brands and do some stuff for influencers. So that's sort of where that was born, really. And that was where it that that was coming to life. But obviously, the business had a lot of responsibility. There was a lot going on. But at the back end of 2019, I then made a decision with my business partner that we would sell the company. That was it. We packaged it. We then had to learn how to sell a company. Um, we basically, that in itself is crazy. Like even just dealing with um, people who are interested, you know, going through them, they want to audit you. They want to audit everything with a fine, of course, as well, in an understandable form. Um, they want to then look at all of our tenancies. They want to go into every room, which obviously requires legal notice, things like that. They want to then audit your accountant and everything else. So it was back and forth. And anyway, we, we were right at the end now, right, right at the end. And then guess what? The pandemic hit. Yeah. COVID cut set in. And uh, he just pulled out, you know. And, uh, and so we just sort of, you know, put our pens down and tried to breathe through a pandemic, tried to manage that as much as we could. And then, you know, it was sort of like, and then that was when I had my time. And, and again, I'm very grateful as much as there's been so much horrific pain through this pandemic for people who have lost close members of their family or, you know, have, have had gone through their own pain and their own journey. For me at the time, it made me still, Mel, for yeah. the first time in years. I was still and I could think, OK, what is this? And I loved beyond as I was growing all this business, I always knew that was for the collective it, start, it started obviously thinking I was going to be famous, but I always knew I was going to, I was for the collective. Like I love to help others. I love to help on the masses. Whenever I got opportunity to support other people in their businesses, I loved it. Even at the property company, like me and Laura laugh now because we're still great friends. She says, I remember when you were like wanting to do a YouTube channel with it. So I always wanted to help, always wanted to mentor and bring to life what we were doing and, and, and almost like give the tools to that younger woman and that younger person to be honest to just go you can do anything you really can and like you know just try it's not about looking at the whole mountain it's just the next step it's just one thing at a time like there's you know and, and just try and so on and then and, and so yeah I just sort of found peace with what I was trying to be and do um and then you know I had a lot of close friends and a lot of people reached to me and say you you make everything make sense to me you mentor me through crazy times that never make sense and just the way you say it in your visuals and your analogies it just brings truth to my life and I've sat on it and I'm so grateful for that and I actually reached out to an old lady I worked with in property years ago who was a friend as well and she was a mentor for, for women at the time. And I just said, I think I need you. And she went, what do you need? What you just built? No, you don't, all this stuff. And I went, no, I do. I think I need you for accountability. I'm doing this on my own this time. And I'm trying to figure out what it is that's next for me. 
and I knew it wasn't the property business. I knew I wanted a business. I loved my photography and I just didn't know how it all mapped together. And then at this point too, myself and my business partner, we actually agreed to um, seize the company and basically cut ties with it and lose, lose out. Because to repackage and to sell another to sell a company, it's about six months of work once you've got an interested buyer. And, and I didn't want to part with my time anymore. I didn't, I couldn't, Mel. It was just too much. And for her, it was. And I, tr I truly knew, and I've always known this, that I'll be abundant forever. Like I, w I was like, I'm not frightened. I'll make money in a different way. Like, this is learnings, but I just need to cut with this now. So we've done everything in the light, in the most um, legal sense that we could do, you know, and all the landlords were grateful because they had business, like, that was already set up that was working in their houses we'd invested a lot into them to making them the, the way that they were and so on that's why the contracts had value and that's why they were worth money but yeah um, and we were very savvy in the company the balance sheet wasn't you know too unhealthy so we didn't completely walk away with nothing but it just wasn't you know the the greatest of outcomes I guess if you look at it from a financial point but it was the best decision I ever made um enrolled with my mentor and straight up she was like you're a mentor Laura and actually you're just enough with who you are and how you're showing up right now and it's the first time in my life where I stopped looking out where I stopped looking at how do you get what that powerful person's got how do you get that wealth how do I take, take control that when I get that I'll be this and then I can have the husband that fits and then I'll have the child that fits because I'll have the financial freedom to do it how I want to do it like for the first time now I realized the age of 30 I was like yeah no life doesn't really work like that and actually also it's quite an easy way of doing it as well and um and there is where I really started to listen to my heart my higher self I've done a lot a lot unpacking as you can imagine as I've an analyzed everything that I really realized what was going on when I was a lot younger what happened to me in in the performing environment and stuff um, and just the way the world is at the minute and, and what I was sort of validating in the toxic traits of what happens and and yeah so at that point I was so so grateful and privileged and that's where my mentoring journey started and um, I've been the most prosperous I've ever been in my life I have the most happiness the most truest like authentic fulfillment I've ever had and I have the grace and like space to help build other women's businesses and every day I promise you Mel I still it's like I feel like I'm tripping life I'm like how is it this easy and this is all of us have this all of us have something I truly believe that you know it does look different for everyone and it might come at different points in your life but um I think it's unpacking society our curriculum our limitations the expectation the trauma where somebody's maybe bullied you in your life or said something you're not enough in your life it's unpacking all of that and then figuring out what that inner child just is and and is passionate at and truly believing that that, that, that there is wealth there you, you just have to work from that place and trust that that's the byproduct as opposed to going out to make it um and yeah, and, and, and I'm very, very grateful that photography just fits. It just ties in because it all is a part of who I am and what I do. And now um, I'm very grateful. But whenever brands reach out or whenever I'm working with a client, it's only from a space where I truly believe the authentic message is the same as mine. So it will be me taking work or campaigns to be able to um, lift women and to inspire and to ensure that. I really try, always try to do a good job of making sure that everybody looks like they are seen in an image. Um, and, and every woman that's watching it, whether they're black, brown, you know, and disabled, um, larger, skinnier, they feel they're seen. Like, and I always encourage brands to understand that and for critical change as opposed to following trends. Um, and yeah, and, and then that's, that is what I feel truly aligned for. It feels like it's my sole purpose, which is such a crazy thing to say but it just makes sense Mel and um yeah I'm sorry to like give that quite a long long-winded um version there but it, I guess it's the truth that's and that's where I am today so um yeah here I am wow <laughs> <laughs> thank you that's so kind it's just um, my story I know but I mean you're you're you've heard this before I'm sure your energy your enthusiasm your uh 
you are so articulate and I don't know if anybody's ever said this to you and please this is a compliment um when at parts when you were talking you reminded me of Russell Brand oh do you know that no one said it but I love that um, <laughs> And you know what's really funny is that I, from a young age, I have had like, you've got a very strong energy. And um, I, don't, I don't think I ever knew how to place that when I was younger. I was like, oh, okay, thank you. And so on. And probably comes from being very, very comfortable in put on, being put it, like in, in just a, an unknown situation. Like I, I feel the most comfortable there, which is for some people that feels very strange. I just think I was very grateful that at a young age I was put on stages because I wanted to be there so you know if I've sung in front of loads of people which I'm not so great at you know I'm sure like you know just to be myself and just talk um isn't as difficult and I uh, yeah and I completely understand that that would fulfill like that for others but thank you so much because I definitely find that a, a massive compliment I love watching him I think he's very engaging yeah yeah me too um I love the fact that he, he fights against the uh, establishment as well. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely rock on. Um, <laughs> that's shown my age, isn't it? Um, no, I love it. <laughs> so, okay, I mean, there are so many, there are so many different pathways you've taken. There are so many things I could, I could question you on. In terms of the, the one thing that did stick out to me, especially with what's, um, what's happening or certainly been happening or certainly come to the limelight in the last few years and certainly the story that's hitting the headlines at the moment with Prince Andrew you talked about the uh, you know the sexualism and and um, what was happening when you were a model is that you know without talk about what you want uh, uh, or not but you know in terms of I've been down a million rabbit holes in the last couple of years in terms of what's going on in the world what's really going on in the world um, and I've woken up to uh, some horrific truths that have been going on under our noses and, and you know, it's been very well hidden. Um, and a lot of it is to do with um, trafficking and um, human trafficking, child trafficking and all the rest of it. So I was just quite interested when you were talking about how you felt in those rooms and how there was almost a jealousy from other women if they weren't getting that kind of attention, which is just bonkers, isn't it, you know? Yeah, so, heartbreaking. Yeah, because because like you said, you know, we, especially like the way magazines are glamorized and everybody's filtered and you've got to have a cleavage and you've got to have the perfect teeth and you've got to have this and you've got to have that. And, you know, the way society's gone in the last, well, God knows how many decades, women have been looking at the extrinsic, as you call it, you know, the looking good, the false hair, the false whatever, to make them look as pretty as somebody else. Um, and if they don't get that attention, then they're not worth anything. So just, I suppose, long winded way of asking, you know, a bit more about that situation for you. And, and was it, was it, a hard was it a hard time for you or were you in that sort of position where you were just like well up yours you know and you sort of were able to you know whack it off do you know what Mel it's really weird because I feel like you can't talk about privilege and um the bad ship if that's a word because I'm not that clever with words I try and learn. Um, wow. I don't know if that is, I don't know if it's a word, I might have just made it up. But <laughs> I, with basically the negativity of privilege, there is also positivity. And the thing is, is I think that's the space where I feel like if we're doing good work in the world um, and giving good spaces and educating as opposed to shaming, you know, pretty privilege, if we want to call it that. And I do believe it is that. And I've understood that, you know, in a younger form. Um, being sexualized um, and having skinny privilege, white privilege, this Western privilege. The thing is, is you, you do get a free drink and you do get an upgrade now and people do welcome you um, around the world, wherever. And, and people don't cross the road and feel frightened of you like they might if you were black with a hood on yeah. um, down across the road or they would try and they would, they would feel more comfortable to walk next to you and so on. So I, I think it's not fair to 
talk about the negative without the positive and that goes hand in hand with a lot I'm sure of the opportunities I was given you know and, and I think women also are very very intuitive you know in that feminine energy and I believe like the, for us to evolve fully in a really ideal great world it is the balance of the female and the masculine energy because again like there's another unpacking with men but if they feel naturally feminine they're also feeling like they can't do that in this world because they are also taught to be, you know, the one that makes the decisions and the one that provides and the one that, you know, is the secure one and he doesn't get emotional and we're moving through it. But I, I am still aware that that is the biggest bracket um, of deaths for men is suicide still yeah. uh, in the UK. I believe it's from the ages of like uh, 25 to 35, I think. Or I could be wrong on that. It could be slightly different, but it is it's scary. And I think this is the thing about, again, the stigma against the feminism because and I'm feminist it's like it's not about you know women aren't great and we're not her we're not seen and we want this we want that and we want all these things it's it's about both things evolving and actually it will be a beneficial thing for a man as well but um sorry getting back um round because I feel like I've gone off topic a little and um, there is there is amazing things about um the privilege of those attributes but what it did for me, Mel, is it stripped me from who I am. Because what starts to happen is it's like the gaslighting effect. You know, um, like the narcissistic process of if somebody says to you enough, um, you're, you know, like you're skinny, you're skinny, or, or like, you know, you've got a great body, 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 or you're beautiful, you're beautiful, you're beautiful there comes a point where you don't think you're anything else I promise you it's crazy so and and I've had some really like open vulnerable and I'm really grateful for their space but chats with friends that are like western super privileged like pretty as in like as you say like literally looking like that airbrushed um picture which is the desirable image within our western beauty culture um, and the capitalism or, of advertising but um it's, it's scary because the problem with that is that there becomes a point where you start questioning who you are without that and so that's the scary factor and going back to those rooms and those other women that were around me I think um again I'm sure from a very very good strong provided for um, upbringing in my family um and just a sense of a strong identity from a young girl as much as um, it did hurt, like as in, I, I, it made me feel lost it, because so many people said it all the time. So it was that feeling of going, okay, then you start thinking it yourself. You're like, well, I am that. Okay, what does that mean for me? It means I get this. It means that people like me. It means that men like me. But you're always questioning why. You know, you're questioning why you've got the job and then you're trying to then play the system because in your mind you think, oh, well, if I just sort of like um, adhere to their... Um, masculine ego I'll then go in do a great job and then that's how I get in because then other people will give me the job because then I'll be seen for my brain and you see how it's such a complex way of of it, it's like um it's like coding it's like you have to keep moving of who you are to try and map this world as opposed to feeling safe in a space where you can just out this and I think this is it, like Emma Thompson has a beautiful, she done a beautiful interview, but it was talking actually around um, the stuff that's gone on with Prince Andrew. And she just sort of says like the power shift is still not equalized. And this is the problem. Like even with all the work that we're doing, when you root out the problem, that power shift is still far too unbalanced with women and men in this, in, in these, in, in just as that in an isolated um, chat in just that industry, that alone that's where we still have a big big problem um because it, you know at what point are you heard or at what point do you feel safe to to be honest or do you think your career will be taken away because the reality of it now and this is the scary stuff out there the reason why I think those other girls maybe felt that way is because they didn't have a strong connection to identity as much as me mm. um so they just sort of was stirring and they were like being led and they just thought well that's it they were so validated by that constant um, probably push of who they are and what they are and what they've got to do being sexualized objectified and stuff and um, it is you know it is that it becomes that um and so um and also there's not safe spaces and and I I did see and I do know that when you do do these things or when that does happen you do get the job you get it so you do get the job 
you know and that's the craziest thing about this um and then it's very hard and tough because then you know we, the, there can be a lot of women who feel very insecure and they almost feel like to be heard they'd rather be in the patriarchy gang the misogyny gang do you know what I mean by that then they're not it's like it's like that whole th- like culture going back to the mean girls it's like I'd rather be in the mean girls hating life than not being it at all so then you'll get a lot of wives that just sort of validate it because they think that that's what their job is and actually that's what is, is the exchange for a lovely life in money materialistic terms and and so on and so I think it's very complex it's, it's, it's a lot to unpack but um yeah I mean they're, they're, that's a bit more information in terms of that environment and what I can see and from being in it and my perspective on it in my lived experience and probably possibly from those others that were there too mm. yeah and that's really insightful um because you know I, I'm I'm probably more the masculine energy than the feminine energy. I've always been ambitious and, and all of that. And very much like you, you know, more um, Teflon. I'm not going to let insecurity. I'm not saying I wasn't insecure. I still have my insecurities now, but um, much less so than some people I know and some friends, etc. And I've always, I suppose, not, uh, not struggled, but just wondered how it gets to that level. And you've just described it perfectly, um, especially in that industry, because, you know, especially modeling, it's all about how you look and what your body's like and all of that, of course. Um, But then it it continues and it probably started from a, you know, from a younger age in terms of their upbringing or whatever, but then it continues into the marriage or it continues into whatever. And that's their life. Yeah. And that's yeah, yeah. really, really fucking sad, isn't it? And yeah, it's really sad. And it's why I'm so passionate about young women and just having the tools to understand what privilege is, to understand how it can help you, to understand what it serves for you, but actually understand how you say yes and no and understanding boundaries at a younger age. Um, I think, again, it, it is like, as you say, it's that feminine energy and just, you know, the grass that we were placed on when we were born and, you know, women women had it much, much tougher hundreds of years ago and so on. So we're definitely always progressing, but it doesn't make it OK. Yeah. And it's about um, it's about how instead of keep like, you know, doing this cancel culture or shaming people, it, it's about giving people space to feel, you know, to maybe blame in certain situations, but also like to then reeducate because shaming doesn't get us anywhere it just makes people feel caged again oppressed again and they can't they can't even ask why something was said to them that made them feel such a thing and 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 how maybe that they there was a deaf tone in terms of what they were saying or um or being and I think this is the thing isn't it? it it is hard and also as well I think we're learning and there's a lot a lot of evidence now like you know there's some great great people at the forefront that's leading it but even listening to Brene Brown and and um, Glennon Doyle, I was listening to the other day, she's a lovely advocate for women and energy and understanding the feminine and the masculine. And I think this is where we are evolving. And it's a little bit like leading off from what you were just talking about now. It's, it's the understanding that actually, when we place an outward feminine energy in the way that we lead, it gets insane results, insane results. Like when we're actually when we are vulnerable, when we show vulnerability as a leader, guess what? It allows our team to be vulnerable. It gives a good space for this non-performative crap to, to evolve. You know, we go in masculine in a toxic form, like I want results. Why aren't we getting results? We need to hit action. Guess what? Everyone feels that they cannot be vulnerable. They cannot be feminine in their outward movement. And guess what? They're just gonna show up, be performative, but you're never gonna get them the best out of people. You know, and, and, and the last forefront is is your business. So the business is going to suffer too. And it's I think that's the biggest thing I'm learning as a leader is is actually like the most articulate skill we can learn as good leaders is listening. Mm. And it's so mad because we think we've all cracked that down and we just, we I think we underestimate how simple it feels and is. But it isn't. And I think it starts with, with uh, uh the unpacking of what that is and and as I say like you know moving forward with an outward feminine energy where you show that as a leader and you know when shit hits the fan in a business when you show kindness as opposed to trying to find action or blaming and shaming um 
people just feel heard and seen as humans. And, and that's it. That's, that's the best, that, that is the best way that we can get the best out of anything. And I think it goes for the same in relationships, you know, like it all comes back to that communication, doesn't it? And um, and actually I think that is why the feminine energy is so underestimated and it's such a strength. And I think it's coming. We're, we're starting to get it. Like I even see like, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk as a quite a big dominant male leader um, as a business owner and on social media and content. He's very feminine in his outward ways. And you know, like you don't, I don't know him. So I don't know how much, you know, that, it's just what he's showing up as or if he is that every day but I mean all of the content I see is very much like that and we can all be masculine but it's understanding and I feel like we should always be both but it's understanding like I think when we're doing it out of a toxic sense that's like what you said like as a woman like it's us trying to figure out you know are we going into this meeting that's with another nine men with outward masculine traits because we've been gaslit for our feminine our whole life you know, it goes back to that whole thing of, you know, if you saw a director in his desk and he had his children up, he, he's kind and he's approachable. If you saw a woman, she's emotional, she's a weak. Yeah. You know, so it goes back to that whole simple concept. And so I think that's where we have to be brave enough as women and and be OK with like moving forward in that energy and just working through with our results. And and that's why it is a complex um thing and it's a lot of unpacking you know and, and that's what I recognized in myself you know for years in business like and for years in my life I moved with that um very like sarcastic outward I you know I'm the achiever I'm I I'm a hustler I'm this I'm that like I'm like as opposed to like that energy that said do you know what I'm really struggling today and I really I'm really struggling and I feel this feeling of burnout but I just I feel vulnerable to stop because I feel like that means I'm failing you know, like I just, I think they're the conversations where I really, really constantly want to put out for others to feel heard and seen. And, and I think that's the thing too. It's like, again, it, it, it all goes hand in hand with this idea of happiness and how we're outwardly looking for it. Because when you see then people show up like that, it creates this um, copy culture, doesn't it? You just think, well, you have to be that or you have to shop by like that or actually to have a successful business. I need to be up at 5 a.m. And I certainly don't, Mel. <laughs> that is not flow for me. And it is nah. for some people, but it isn't for me. And I used to feel shame around that. I used to think, oh, bloody hell, I don't ever really, I don't ever really book in a meeting till 10. But now I don't because I, I have nothing to feel shame around because my results are my results. So I, I know it works for me. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I was always constantly chasing something that I thought was meant to be and what, how it was meant to look and and so on. So so yeah that that's what I'm really passionate about and sharing and and speaking more about openly um well just listen to you then a shameless plug from me um the the episode that got published on my podcast this this week is um a wonderful woman called Nar um she's got three surnames and um they've all they're all they all begin with a and it's oh my god Nar Amelie something something um uh, sorry, Nar, if you're listening. Um, but she's basically running to be the first female president of Ghana in 2024. She's, she's oh, how incredible! Yeah, she's UK born, um, but she's Ghana heritage. And listening to the story of how it came about is incredibly divine, inspirational, spiritual, uh, and everything else. And just listening to you talking about the female masculine, um, which was happening on the last podcast interview I did earlier today as well. Um, yeah, I think you'd enjoy it. I think you'd get a lot out of that. Oh, I really would. Thank you so much. No, I'll definitely listen to that. I mean, any woman that feels she can take on like a country is, I think, incredible anyway, because Jesus, there's even more to unpack there, isn't it? And, <laughs> and again, for me, you know, like I'm on my journey and I'm moving forward and I, I am here to, I want to, really really reach and support so many women and um, but how I mentor is bespokely so at the minute I truly believe that you know and I'm sure you can gain from just my lived experience and me working out of my knowledge and just who I am is that I truly believe we all require something different and so all of my mentoring is all bespoke one-to-one -one. and I really tried to set up an academy last year to cater for more because I had these discovery calls and and it's a reflection in people's investment too so I wanted to cater for more but it just didn't work now and that's what I mean and I think that's why it's an incredible position 
to um, and so credible to be able to feel that you can go into parliament because at that point it's not about the individual you're trying to juggle for the collective yeah represent and that's them. hard yeah, yeah it's hard you know Definitely. that's a hard job because someone's always going to lose well so yeah it's hard I mean, it's been governed by men, as you can imagine, for a long time. Well, and, and that in itself, geez. But um, that's incredible. No, I'd love to listen to her. She sounds amazing now. She is. Um, so how did, obviously, the, the property thing, you know, you'd, you'd had enough. Unfortunately, you never got to sell the business. I'm assuming that you were sort of doing a rent to rent thing. Um, yeah, yeah, there you go, Mel. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, again, we started with no capital. So, you know, we, we actually borrowed money. We borrowed um, money, which is ironic, to get a mentor, <laughs> which is where, where I met my first, like where I met my mentor now. Yeah. And um, back back in the day, that was 2014. We started that, and um, it's because we always wanted to be by the book. We and we're both very, you know, have that in common. We love to learn, and we we knew that this was a like, honestly in reflection. Now I think, what was we thinking? Like the most one of the most like hardest businesses to tackle and, and just even from like a logistics point of view you know what I mean like even the fact that we were going in we've never owned property never had a property we're two young women and mm. um, we've got no shop front and there we are like we're going against big agents like we are like like battling on contracts and at that point we wasn't even asking for 12 uh, months we were asking for three or four years because as Mel said the concepts of understanding what rent to rent is or let to rent in the property world what it's known for is basically you have an, a management agreement with a landlord and the way we set up is we get we offered them a um, guaranteed rent every month which is what landlords liked um and then we basically made our margin by letting out each room. But then there was thousands of investment from us on the forefront because we always proud and um, took pride in ourselves that we everything with regulation standards and more. And you would think that's normal, Mel, but you'd be shocked at the amount of houses we got called to or asked to go and see that had nothing, you know, and the tenants were so vulnerable in there, like as in just lots of staple stuff that you require. It's almost setting up like a commercial let really like, you know, fire panels, like fire points and you know just so much the signage like fire doors lots of stuff like in one house we even needed a sprinkler system like it was just crazy but um but yes yeah, so that was amazing um, amazing experience and, and everything makes sense Mel because I never would have been where I am without that but yeah absolutely that's that's that is what um our business model was yeah. um and yeah we we grew it and I, I am you know I'm very proud of what we did we're so proud of each other and you know what we were doing and what we the challenges we faced and and yeah and just navigating this world I guess <laughs> so so obviously you you sort of let go you know it was so hard work with that buyer that unfortunately Covid hit and it never happened and then you just had the peace and the wisdom by the sounds of it to let it go um how you, you talked about your mentor and your mentor was the one that said to you you need to be a mentor do you think without that conversation you'd be doing what you're doing um maybe you would because you seem like an absolute natural to me anyway so um but also how did you transition from property photography to all of a sudden finding women and you're going to 10 million women or, or more um how did that happen and, and where did these women come from well um it basically sorry to answer your first question mel I do think I would be doing this because yeah. it feels so divine and that sounds so mad because there's some of the language I talk in never had it in my life you know <laughs> I, was, I was like a strict atheist I was like no and, and as well I, I don't I don't actually believe in God at any more uh, still and I don't believe in uh you know I don't believe in origin uh, religion but do I believe in universal work I absolutely do learning about quantum physics and I truly believe I've quantum drummed like to be able to visualize manifest and and I do it with my clients and there's a lot around it, but I think, again, it's kind of like a big, it, it, there's been a lot of um, selling around it. So it almost feels a bit like a wizardry thing to a lot of people, like law of attraction and all of that stuff. But there's just so much like sense in it when you get into it. And, you know, and a lot of people do it without even realising that it's, um, but yeah, I definitely think I would have 100% got there. Do I think I would have done it as quickly without her? No. Do I think I would have been able to stand in my power, my worth, and unpack the way that I did without her? No. Um, and I don't think I would be able to have been attracting the wealth I did as quick as I can without her. Because the thing that I had, and I had to cross over to Mel, is I always knew I could build businesses, 
but I lacked, believe it or not, I mean, I know I'm very outwardly confident, but I lacked belief in myself mm -hmm. that I was deserving. You know, like, even when I said to you, we were the last to be paid in our company. And, and that times weren't, you know, um, and, that, and that was it. And, and I think that's where, for the first time, understanding that I was, an, uh, I was enough and actually what I was doing and how I was navigating forward was a massive um, value to others. I could, I was, it took me time to get my head around that. I was like, yeah, but I'm just being me. Yeah. These are conversations I give away for free. And then I started to learn about energy exchange. And what I mean by that is it's like understanding, like um, we almost see it in businesses when you have the existential crisis, it's, it's what we require as human beings changes at every point in our life. What business requires changes and it grows. So for instance, in 2018, I was very grateful to get a job where I wasn't paid in photography because I was learning. You see, so the energy exchange was me learning and me get, being given space to be able to learn and be in my gifts and like learn that. But guess what? As 2019 hits, if you're still doing it like that, people associate the energy exchange with the common feeling of thinking, oh, I just can't be bothered or I don't enjoy it as much. I'm not so passionate about it anymore. Or um, it's just getting a bit much or I feel a bit resentful for it or I just don't really want to show up today. No, it isn't. That I identify that very, very quickly when I'm, I'm mentoring people and I sit and, I, and they come to me on discovery calls. I can figure out if it's if it is truly intrinsic or I can figure out actually we just need to energy shift them and the thing is is that is a lot to do with the person so what I mean in that moment is actually if I then offered that person the same the same week but actually every day you get paid a thousand pounds you see that's an energy exchange but we have a, all have a weird concept about money you know it's a bit can be a bit taboo you don't talk about those things but actually it's just energy mm. it's just movement but we attach an emotional science to it because we see what it can get us or we can see what it gets us and if I say this is how much it costs someone thinks well that's my rent so they're not thinking about that as a tool at that point they're thinking about the fear so sometimes I just really have to unpack someone for a little while around their money mindset and around you know and I see all of this and so it really is like an inside job and um, and as I say that moves all the time because it's about you you know it could actually be that the energy exchange is that you get um, less money, but I only, I can only, for me, my body and what I like to do now and who I am now, I only want to be working four days a week. So how does that shift? Do you see what I mean? And maybe I have to mentor, figure out how we get that in this amount of space, or maybe it is the energy imbalance in, in how they're showing up, they're doing so much. And that was okay when they were 20, but it's not okay at 25. So I just need to work out how we get support. And you see, it's a different energy exchange. So um, that's what I would say I, I understood straight up and she shifted out in me because as I say um I was so I was that I was in like level two mindset fully whereas that hustler I was an overachiever I was I was just I was just thought I had to work 12 hours a day and um, every day um, and then I would like let out steam and like just leave the country for three days turn everything off and then come back and yeah and and so um when I started to understand the value of what I could just do just not overworking I was like are you crazy this is mad and then um, and yeah and I, and I never underestimate the amount of money that people invest in me but after now doing it for a year and seeing the results that I can get with people and then reinvesting in someone which I'm always so grateful for if I feel I can still help them more in their journey um I, I never underestimate that it's a lot of money but I also see the RO, ROI in it now Fully. Mm -hmm. so I do get that in my gifts now and it's taken time really time to build that in and where do you, where do these women come from you know how because you know you started a new business again um, yeah it's crazy isn't it well yeah. do you know what Mel again I think it's it all goes back to the intrinsic stuff like if it just is you you just have to show up as you so at the time I had my photography Instagram and I think I'd about, do you know what, Mel? Um, I'm so sorry. I'm just going to plug you in. Is that okay? Sorry, listeners. I am yeah, still yeah. with you, but I don't want to lose you. And I, this is my fault, right? We all learn. It's all learnings. But I should have plugged you in before because I've just seen my <laughs> battery getting low. Um, no problem. But I'm still with you. So, um, so yeah, going back to that, I um, at the point, it was all from Instagram, pretty much. Um, 
And I think I realized obviously quite quickly just through, you know, having a lot of skill around, um, I had a lot of natural skill around selling, around marketing, because I'd done all that in the business. So I sort of knew that aspect of stuff. And I just knew that I had to reach out. I knew that I had to be present. I knew that if I wanted to find these divine clients and these ladies, I had to talk my truth um, and sort of start showing up. So I would do sort of small clips and videos on Instagram. And God, that took time because that was the most vulnerable river I could ever describe. It was like someone threw me off a cliff. I was like, are you mad? Why do people want to listen to me? This is cringe. <laughs> Like, I'm just talking a load of crap that I spill down the pub to four other people. And um, and over time, I got more articulate. And over time, I listened to that intuition. I could, like, unravel that wisdom. And it's there. And it, and it would just come. And then, like, people would be in front of me. And I knew. I would be like, we need to adjust this, this, this in your business. And this will... And, it, and, and like we just got incredible results and I was just so grateful for that trust and for the platform and and at the time as well it was sort of going hand in hand with photography so to begin with my um my packages included a day of me shooting too because it was quite relevant right, yeah with some businesses um and then what I realized was again my energy change shifted again so I knew that at that point it, it, I needed to it, it just wasn't included and that was an additional if people wanted that because I think I was believing in my gifts more as just a mentor um and yeah and that sort of brought me really to today and 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 I'm just so grateful and and just little things as well and, and going back to like you know and um, being very grateful to be working with my mentor and and just um again sort of old habits and understandings of like marketing strategy from the past uh, you know when I was building another business because we had no budget and that's that's and I honestly believe as well it's crazy like when you level up in a company when I see small businesses going bigger the biggest thing they think they need is people time or money and half the time it isn't none of those they don't know what they want at that point they're they're lost in in why they're showing up or their vision until we really know the strong goals we're hitting we don't know what we need but you sort of like they just basically they've basically grown and they then they feel fear because it's the next river. So, you know, it's a bit different when you're gambling a hundred pounds to a thousand pounds to ten thousand to a hundred thousand. And that's all about training that muscle. And that's why, you know, it's um it, it's just so incredibly amazing to be a mentor and to have a mentor because I see the value in it. Mm. You know, and she does, she has a mentor, and this is the thing, it's like, and we're all on different growth journeys for different things, but I think it all comes back down to that masculine energy again mm. it feels like you're failing if you're asking for help or it feels like you're failing or you're not good enough or no enough if you're not figuring it all out on your own or looking like you know well why do I need any help when I've figured this out so far and done this but again I, I truly believe I see it and I knew it in myself we all have a ceiling we all have our own limitations all of us from whatever we've been shown in our lives whatever we've achieved so far like some people could sit in a room and say you know, I think you're doing all right. And it's quite difficult to earn 50k a year. And some people could go, you know, I think you're doing all right. And, it, and it's quite difficult to earn a quarter of a million a year. And they generally could feel the same feelings. Again, money's just a number. It's just a digital thing. It's just an energy, but it's the way we see it and understand it. And that takes time. It mm -hmm. takes time to nurture that muscle. And it's funny, it's, it's, I was watching something the other day, and I can't remember who it was, but they were describing how most people that get rich quick, lose it quick. Because yeah. they haven't trained that muscle. They, they don't know how to manoeuvre it. They're too emotionally attached to it. They don't know how to... And that's the thing. And, you know, and so I never underestimate that. But I always know as well, if someone's really willing to invest, they're also ready now. Yeah. They're ready. They are ready to be vulnerable. They're ready to take action. They're ready to listen. Um, and I always say it's like a, a river of vulnerability. I always say that I truly believe in our lifetime we sort of go down to this riverbank and it's quite nice there and you can do nice things and sit there with friends. You can meet different people. You can experience joy and happiness. But I almost feel like it's always most, most human beings looked at the other side of the riverbank and they can see something that just in their dream or in their heart or, you know, something that they desire to do or to be or to have. And, um, we do this cognitive dissonance thing where we almost convince ourselves we're like oh well you know it's too many of them or well I wouldn't be able to do that because you know probably like you know I couldn't afford it and other people can and, and you know you'd have to train so much to be that or you know like I probably just wouldn't be very good at it or why would people want to listen to me and all that and basically what that is is the river in between 
It's like the unknown, fear, scarcity, like imposters, you know, trauma. It's all of that in the middle. And I always say as a mentor, I sit in the river. I sit in it. I'm in it. And I'm going, right, get in, get your leg in. And you, I can't swim it for you. You have to swim, but you have to trust also in how I'm steering you. And it's funny because my clients get that now. So um, I remember saying to uh, one of them a few weeks back, I remember saying, look, you're doing a great job, but right now only your toes in and I need your leg in. And they get it. They get <laughs> yeah, it because yeah. they know what they're holding back on. Um, and it's just so beautiful when people trust and they dive in and they're always all right. Normally we're always okay, you know. Um, it's crazy how much our mind limits us. Um, and it's there to protect us, isn't it? It's the ego is that. It's there as protection. But a lot of it is full of fake news and stuff that doesn't serve us. And I think, yeah, that's it. But again, it's up to the individual. That's another thing I've learned massively last year. You know, you can't fix people. There's a difference between fixing and mentoring. And that makes a good mentor, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, thank you for that. I might use that analogy myself. Um, no, you can. <laughs> so, Laura, if, if anybody wanted to work with you, where would they find you? What's the easiest way to get in touch? So, Mel, I would say laurabelcher.com. So that's my full name.com. That's my website. Um, it's my core hub at the minute. And me and my assistant, we're working really hard to put more valuable stuff on there, to put all my podcast appearances and bits and pieces on there and um, also there's free masterclasses you can download so I always try and do one every quarter where I do an hour of really valuable information that I really try and pack in to as a, a you know to give back because I'm very grateful for people's support and um, people who follow me and if people have discovery calls and they're not in a financial place right now to invest but they are so connected or resonate with what I'm saying or what I'm doing I'm grateful to be able to give that space. So there's a few on there that you can literally just click and download. The only thing I ask for you is your email that sends you the link to it. And that's it. You can watch it. And there's, um, yeah, I've got how to tackle imposter syndrome on there. I've done a masterclass from that one. Um, how to build a six figure business in a simple form um, in an hour. Not quite. You can't, you can quite do it in an hour, but there's an hour's info on there. Um, and then my last one that I put up, I'm trying to think. Because I did have a, yeah, I had a bit of a crazy year last year. So there was, a, there's only three on there. But, and the third one is scaling. So, and I, and the reason why I do this and when it comes to me, and this is why I try and keep it organic too, again, because I try and always be in flow. Don't want to force them out, right? If they're not right. sitting there, nothing's coming. But it was a time where so many people were coming to me for advice. I was having so many discovery calls with that small to big business jump. Um. And it was just coming up with so many of the sim most similar um, setbacks or um, hurdles. And um, I just felt compelled to do an hour of it. So, um, so yeah, they're on there. But, yeah, that's the best way. And then there is um, an option that if you do want to, if you feel connected to me and you feel like you'd like to talk to me more, you can book a 30-minute free call with me. And I'm always very, very grateful to be in anybody's space and have a chat. And I'm very chilled as you can imagine yeah. you know you'll normally meet me with a coffee a cup of tea or a wine <laughs> pretty much it but um but yeah so that's that's it pretty much my hub I'd say all right thank you for that um I oh, will you're put welcome it, I will put it in the show notes obviously um okay so I like to close these conversations with anything you feel drawn to say to the listeners anything at all just say, just don't overcomplicate what you feel and think. And really, really, if you're stuck in thoughts, just know that um, that is a collective place of our consciousness. Our morals and our beliefs are just collective thoughts that we've been seeing, that that's, we're saying or we're thinking because we've seen it or we've been around it, but you are limitless can do anything just work through that heart really really ground yourself and just think about when I say that like again I sound very spiritual and I am but like I don't want it to sound like that and people um miss that opportunity to find that for themselves or for it to make sense to them but to just just lay just lay in your own peace or just whatever makes you feel what we call in a high vibration so that's either you know whatever it is for you like listen to your favorite music 
or being with a glass of wine or sitting with your dog or being out with your friends or when you're driving in the car and you're driving somewhere where you don't really want to be really really take that time to just really try to shut down the mind the thoughts and think from your heart and sometimes that isn't a thought it's just a feeling but don't doubt it intuition is super powerful and everything you need is in within you it really is nice nice yeah you're you're speaking from my my heart as well there so um thank you laura it's been it has been an absolute pleasure to meet you um oh i I likewise and i'm so grateful for these opportunities because without amazing women like you i wouldn't be able to come on and share my wisdom and experience either so thank you so much thank you i appreciate that um and thank you so much for your time and and have a wonderful weekend because it's friday you're welcome (laughs) Uh, absolutely and to your listeners i hope you all have a lovely weekend Yeah. All right. Thank you.